So, hi, um, thanks for coming, and thanks for doing a short lunch to be able to make it to this talk. Um, I work at Blacklane. Blacklane is not a software company. Uh, it's a premium kind of chauffeur service. Uh, but we have a lot of software that support the company's business. And at Blacklane, I do Android. I do open source stuff. Um, I get interested in, in all kinds of things. And so does my team and the surrounding teams. So one of these things was coroutines. When they came out, it was like, boom, some new stuff from JetBrains, from Kotlin. It's all amazing, it's all nice, but nobody wants to try it out. Nobody wants to learn it, nobody wants to uh, risk. So basically we did some kind of study and this, is, this talk is kind of a output of, of this study and of our tests. And so now we start, started using coroutines in production. So with that said, can I, can I see how many people use coroutines in production? Okay, so not everyone. And how many people use Rx Java, Rx Kotlin in production? Okay, so a lot more. Yeah, this is this is kind of expected. So um, I'll try to quickly go through uh, what we had, where we are today, and then go into exactly what the talk is about. So error handling. So uh, I'll try to go through these quickly. Um, if you have any questions, I hope. Uh, we can discuss it afterwards. You can also use the chat, um, but uh, we'll, we'll have some time allocated at the end. So, quick recap. So, why did we start? I will move. So, so why did we start using ReactiveX? Um, we had weird issues with async tasks. We had uh, issues with threads being heavy, especially. In the early days of Android, this was not optimized well. Um, we were doing background services to do asynchronous work. We were canceling tasks in a wrong way. We were producing some weird memory leaks. Uh, we had a, this thing that's called callback hell. If you don't know what it is, Google it. You'll get scared. Like It's huge stacks of callbacks, one inside of the other. Um, yeah, and it's pretty ugly. So. This is how the Rx code looked like. Uh, so we had some uh, slow task that's going on, and then we would specify where to run these tasks, and then where to get the result or the error. Um, and then you had pretty much in this functional way, you get one place to handle your success results and one place to handle your errors. So it was kind of convenient. What we got from it, uh, we basically got type safety, we got deferred task starting, we had exactly one success callback and one error callback. So this is all pretty good. Some other benefits, uh, we had easy worker thread switches, so we could just jump onto a different thread or a pool of threads or create a custom thread, whatever you want, it's super easy. You just use this subscribe on and observe on. Um, and then you could concatenate kind of, you can connect uh, observables one onto the other, and then in the end you get a chain. Well, I like the onion uh, description more than a chain, because it's kind of more similar to an onion. One observable is like containing another inside of it. But in any case, you have a chain or a stream um, with Rx, and finally, we would be able to do thread, sa uh, thread safe task cancellation. So you would get a subscription or you would get a disposable, depending on the Rx version that you're using. And then you would just say uh, dispose. So there is one function, you just dispose and that's it. You never get the callback, you never get the result error, you don't get anything, it's dead. So it's technically not dead, but it will not report anything. Okay, so why did we suddenly stop liking Rx. So some of the reasons, probably the biggest reason, is that it's a large third-party library. So it's maintained by uh, people in the community, some guys from Netflix, of course, Jake Wharton. Uh, basically, it's, it's huge. And you need to import it, and then you use like 5% of its capabilities. Um, it has a steep learning curve, meaning that you would need to learn a lot before you can actually use it with confidence in production. 
especially if you want to start doing tests, then you have to learn another set of things to be able to test code that uses Rx. Um, debugging became kind of difficult. On, in short chains, yeah, it's not too bad, but in like long chains where you are doing custom transformations, mapping, flat mapping, all of this stuff, it just kind of became difficult. Uh, people also started abusing it, like instead of doing for loops for a list of, I don't know, 100 items, you would see people creating observables and then doing streams and then doing some uh, subscription on the stream, maybe even switching threads for a loop of 100 elements. So that's considered abuse. Um, and then finally, a new built-in concept was available, the coroutines, and here we are today. So the coroutine code looks something like this. So you have you will have some, uh, they call it coroutine launcher or whatever, but you have some function or looks like a keyword in this DSL where you would just launch some code and then the, your coroutine is this block here. So you would run some, uh, run some tasks, you wrap it in some IO thread or something, and it kind of, you, you can catch exception, it kind of looks like uh, normal synchronous code. So some of the benefits we got from introducing coroutines is we eliminated callbacks in the sense where you would uh, subscribe to something and wait for a result. You actually, coroutines internally do the same thing, but it's hidden from you as a developer, you don't see it you don't read the code this way. Um, we have uh, the simplified future syntax with async. You have async code that looks like synchronous code, as I already mentioned. We have a small software package. Um, we have cleaner stack trace. They are built into Kotlin, uh, and they have easier modeling of job hierarchy. And why I have asterisks here, because built into Kotlin, yes, some of the keywords, some of the concepts are built in, but not all of them. So you have to include one more extension package, but it's still smaller than Rx, for example. So you can ar argue, for example, that if you use ProGuard, then there is no difference, almost. Yeah, but then you have to use ProGuard. If your project is not using ProGuard at the moment, introducing ProGuard will introduce many more issues, most likely, because you need to optimize the rules and so on. And as for the easier modeling of job hierarchy, depends on where you're coming from. If you're coming from C Sharp or some language that already uh, supports this kind of async concept, then for you it's probably not a big deal. But if you're coming from Rx or you're coming from uh, plain Java, um, it's a big deal. So um, let's quickly recap on scope versus context, and I will. Uh, I will switch to the main point. So, uh, I don't know if you've seen some graphs like this before. So they look quite complex. So I'll try to explain what, what happens. Uh, basically, there is a scope, so it goes all around like this whole graph, and this is, let's say, the parent scope. So this is where you start from. Every scope has a context, and that's the only point of a scope. Scope contains the context, and your context contains everything that your coroutine needs to run. So in this context, you have a job, which is the task that you're doing, dispatcher, which is a mechanism to run your code in a specific thread or in a, on a specific uh, pool of threads. It can be, it's similar to schedulers in Rx. And then you can have exception handler, for example, in your, in your context, and all of these elements, they are all, um, they can all be added together to form one context. So, uh, when you say from, the, from this scope, when you call launch, launch is a function that is available only in the scope. So in this scope, when you say launch, and you, you can give some additional context, like switching threads, like giving another exception handler, like giving another parent job, uh, you can, your new context will get merged with the old context, and you will get a child context. So your child context is merged between, from your parent context and the new context. And this new child context lives in the child scope, which is the dark one. And then your child job goes in these curly brackets, so when you say launch and open curly brackets, 
without specifying context, you'll basically be using the parent context with some minor additional changes, but it doesn't impact too much. So this is kind of uh, what, I, what I meant when I said that they model job hierarchy well. So if you cancel the parent, your child gets canceled. If your child crashes, your parent gets canceled. There are cases where you can work around this, but that's the default behavior. And we didn't have this before. So, on to the main point. So, uh, I will be mentioning real and simulated tasks a lot. So, to be able to differentiate between them, um, I'm differenti differentiating between active and simulated work. Active work mean, meaning something that keeps your CPU busy. To be able to demonstrate this easily, I'm using just a simple while loop. So, I'm looping. I'll show you the code. I'm just looping in, in place, and this is keeping the CPU busy. In a real world scenario, uh, let's say it's a network call. So network calls, you would go, okay, so you would prepare a request, and then you would go to your HTTP client, and then the HTTP client goes to your DNS to fetch the IP, and then it opens some kind of connection, socket, whatever it is, and then it sends the request over, and then the server processes it. You're still waiting, and then the server will return your response, which then you parse, from let's say JSON or XML or whatever, you're parsing it. And then this parsing is also keeping you busy. So there is some real work involved. So this is keeping the CPU busy part. Um, there is no way to stop execution, like in any uh, Java, Kotlin, probably every language on the JVM. Uh, if you run something on a thread, there is almost no way to stop it in place. So the only pl thing you can do is wait until it completes and then hopefully nothing crashes. Um, so this is why with threads, you would need to check if the thread is interrupted or not with doing plain, plain threads. With coroutines, you would check if the job is alive or not. So this is where we differentiate between cooperative jobs and uncooperative jobs. So if you're using stuff like uh, delay, or threads, coroutine delay, or thread sleep, or uh, Rx timer subscribe, it essentially does the same thing. It's kind of doing some simulation of work, waiting there, and if you cancel, or if you interrupt, or if you dispose, respectively, they will throw an exception. All of these three cases, they will immediately throw an exception, which is different from doing actual work. If you're looping and you interrupt, nothing happens. The thread continues looping unless you specify in every loop cycle, oh, am I alive? If not, then stop looping. So it's very important to know the difference between active and simulated work because when we start throwing errors and attempt to crash the app, simulated work will behave differently. Okay, so I created an app. Um, so it's a very simple app. It has, it has a list of tasks here. It has a toggle to throw exceptions whenever a task completes, so you can run any task. If this is on, when the task completes, it will throw an exception. And again, tasks are just looping. For active tasks, looping, and for simulated work, uh, it's just using delay. Um, the activity has this one. It's one fragment. Don't do this. Don't say I told you to do it. But uh, to display this situation, I just use one fragment, and there is no presenter, there is no view model, I just put everything in this fragment, but don't do it. Um, so there is some filters, blah, 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 and then on stop, which is important, on stop will attempt to cancel the task that is running. All right, so what do the tasks look like? So this is pretty straightforward. So I just start looping, and I loop for two seconds. This is actual work. And for simulated work, I just use delay and then put two seconds in there. But that's it. It looks like it's the same thing, but it's actually very different. Okay, and I will show you the common use cases with coroutines and how each of them behaves when there are errors involved. So the base class that I have, this fragment, uh, the most important thing to note is that I have this coroutine context because this fragment is a coroutine scope. So this coroutine context will have a parent job, main dispatcher, and default handler. So default handler is something you don't have to explicitly give to your scope or to your context, but I, I added it because I want to check what happens 
when I throw an error from one of the tasks. So when my tasks crash, I want to catch the crash in this default exception handler. My parent's job is a supervisor job, which means that I can, uh, I can crash the children without canceling the parent job. This is one of the workarounds. And then on stop, and yeah, dispatcher's main meaning that whatever I run from this scope by default runs on the main thread. It will block, obviously. So, and finally, on stop, I will just cancel all children from this parent job. So this is kind of what you would have with a, a nicer uh, architecture. So on stop or on destroy or on pause maybe would cancel all of your jobs. And by default, they all launch on main thread. Um, let's quickly go through what I have. So. I have five most common use cases that I could find. One of them is run blocking. It's a function that allows you to switch from the blocking Kotlin world uh, to async coroutine world. So everything inside of here is considered a suspending code block. It's not actually suspending because run blocking will block your thread and we'll see how that works, but it, you can switch between the worlds. So I do some task execute doing this loop or delay thing, and then I show success. If it throws, I show the error, and I re-throw the error because I want to catch it in the default exception handler. So my goal here is to crash the app. I want to see which of these will crash the app. If my default exception handler caught the error, this means that my app would crash without it. Okay, so run blocking is the first one. The second one is launch. So the launch is available only in the scope. It's the exact same code. So the second one is launch. The third one is with async. So here, async, you do some task, you get some kind of result, and then you can await here with this keyword, you can await for this result to appear. Um, with context is probably the most common use case, the one that you should be using. You specify with context here, and then you execute on a different thread. So this IO here, it's a dispatcher, it's part of the context, and in this context, it will merge with the parent, but everything will be executed on the IO thread, so everything in this code block is on IO thread. So it's async. And then result, because it's outside of this block, the result will be on the default dispatcher for the parent, which is main thread. So the result and error, they report back on main thread. Uh, finally, coroutine scope, it's kind of similar to what um, run blocking does, but it's also similar to launch, and we'll see later how it's similar. So um, I tested error handling with these five use cases, and this is what I got. So I'll show you. Um, let's, see, let's see how many of you think that, okay, so we have five of them. How many of you think that none of them will crash the app if after looping, I throw an error. So will it crash the app? Who thinks yes? You think it won't? Okay, nobody. Um, well, yeah, actually, run blocking always crashes the app, and I'll show you why. Uh, using launch and using async, they will not crash the app, but only because I put a default exception handler in the fragment. With context, will not do anything. Uh, and in a new scope, so with context, it's on the IO thread, doesn't block, default exception handler is there, so this one is safe always. And then uh, coroutine scope, the fifth one, um, it will also block the main thread and it will also go to the default handler. So remember, if I don't have this default handler, my app crashes. With run blocking, even though I have the default handler, the app crashes. Um, so what is what is interesting here is that all of them are blocking. And I have two more rows. So the first one is just doing it like this. Second row is if I reuse the parent job, because I thought maybe that changes something. And the third one is adding an additional handler. Also, I thought maybe this behavior changes something, but no. So it's interesting that all of these will block. So let's see about this run blocking. Why is it so, why is it so difficult? Why does it crash? even though I have a default exception handler. 
So to compare to Rx, um, yeah, I'm focusing a bit more on coroutines because Rx is kind of there for a long while. But yeah, uh, so to compare with Rx, uh, this is what you would do to get kind of the same behavior with Rx. And with coroutines, looks smaller, but essentially you get the same thing. So what, what happens inside of run blocking is that it creates a thread local event loop and then into this event loop, it shoots your tasks. So since it's your only one block there, you would run only one block in this, in this, uh, in this event loop. It starts in a new context because there is no context available. Remember, the run blocking is not part of the scope. It's just a function. So it doesn't know anything about the parent where you're executing from. It has no idea. So it starts a new context. Um, and then it goes and calls join for all of the child jobs. So if you have multiple things running in this run blocking, it will call join for all the child jobs. So to compare to Rx, it uses threads and uh, schedulers, which are also kind of thread pools, and it calls await on these threads internally. Uh, it continues the work when you call blocking get, it continues the work on the current thread same as run blocking, and then waits for the, the whole chain to complete. So in both cases, your current thread gets blocked for the time of this task. If you're running a network thing, and you run with run blocking, or any of these other uh, without switching to IO, you will get a network exception on main thread crash, because it's, it's on the main thread. There is, a, there is an optimization in coroutines if your dispatcher is the main dispatcher, main thread, everything will run in the main thread. Whatever function you use, it will by default run in the main thread synchronously. All right, so that's fine. Run blocking is not a coroutine function, it's just one function that takes a coroutine. So then why is launch, launch is a coroutine function on a scope, shouldn't it be somehow smarter? Well, yeah, no. It's not. So it's creating this uh, standalone coroutine or a lazy standalone coroutine, and it basically calls start. It immediately calls start here, and this coroutine is running on the main thread, so your start will be blocking. It merges the context, that's fine, uh, it, because it merges the context, that's why it uses the main thread. Uh, errors, they are delivered to the resolved exception handler because this is a coroutine scope, so it has a error handler, and then it will go to this error handler. All errors will go there. Um, so what about async? Because async was also going to the default exception handler, meaning that if there was no exception handler, it would crash. Uh, basically, it's almost the same kind of code. It's just, this is the, the main difference. You get deferred coroutine instead of uh, launched coroutine, whatever it's called. So it's kind of the same code. So the same thing happens. Um, you call await to get this value. This is when you're blocking. When you call await, this is when you'll block. Um, it's called kind of similar to join. Yeah, OK. So this is with doing actual work. So running actual work looping, or in, in real situation, it would be network or whatever it is. So. Now I'm testing what happens if I try to do the same thing, so run some task, but this way, uh, this time a simulated task, and then throw an exception. So what would happen in this case? Who thinks, uh, who thinks all of them will be blocking? Okay, you're skeptical. Um, so here's the thing. Uh, none of them are blocking, except for the run blocking, which is kind of obvious. So run blocking will again block and crash, and all of the other ones will keep the main thread uh, available to other tasks. So this is, this is weird. Like, I'm, I'm also using the main thread dispatcher, so what is going on? Why is this, why is this not blocking? Why, if I throw an error, it's fine. The default exception handler will catch it. So why is this happening? So delay is actually not doing anything. So this is the source code, some snippets from the delay implementation, and it's actually not doing anything. So it's just scheduling to this event loop, 
and whenever the event loop pass is coming along, it will pick up this task if the time has passed. So here you would be, you sent like 2,000 milliseconds, event loop goes, runs, 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 and after 2,001 millisecond, oh, I have some task, and then it will continue with your exception. So what I did was delay, and then throw exception. So delay is not doing anything. This is extremely important. It's, it's extremely important because a lot of online tutorials show you that you should be using delay to simulate work, and it actually behaves completely differently from uh, doing actually something with the CPU. And error handling is completely different again. Um, so I also wanted to test two more cases. So one of them is canceling tasks before they finish. So I run the task and then I quit the app. I go out with back. Um, let's see what happens. Okay, wait. So first, cancellation. Um, it's called a cancellation exception with coroutines. With threads, it would be interrupted exception. As I mentioned, when you call uh, delay or with thread uh, sleep or Rx timer, whenever you cancel it, they throw an error. Well, coroutines throw a similar error. It's a cancellation exception here. And I, I searched the source code for coroutine implementation and I found 30 code results in this Kotlin X coroutines. So it, this exception is extremely specific. So they handle it, they check it like, is cancellation exception. So it's very, very specific. With Rx, just to compare a bit, um, you just get a disposable, you call dispose, you get nothing. From there, it's like it's dead. It might be working in the background, but you will not get any results. Uh, it disposes everything upstream, so any chain, if you, if you want to look at it as a chain, it will go uh, through the chain and cancel everything. Um, and then you cannot cancel a substream. So if you have a situation like this, you have some uh, sequence of events with an exception in the end, and then you do some flat map internally, it will create a stream of streams, but you don't have actually access to this, to this stream in between. And the exception will still get delivered. So what you actually react to in the end is like elements, individual elements in a single stream and then an exception. Same, same goes with the cancellation. So if you cancel at any point, uh, they will stop the stream and they will throw an internal exception and, and then stop everything. You will not get any results. So with coroutines, I will show you, um, it's, very, it's very interesting. So again, if I try to cancel, while any of these are working, I, ca I cannot cancel. There is no way. So I call cancel, but the thing is, on stop callback from the fragment or from the activity, it's happening on the main thread. So it means that the main thread, if the main thread is busy by doing some tasks, on stop callback is delayed. So at the time that you want to stop, your task has already executed and the exception has been thrown. So this, this particular um, use case doesn't have an issue because it's running on the IO thread because IO thread is keeping the main thread available for other things, so your on-stop callbacks will still get delivered. So interestingly, again, with context, we'll get to the default exception handler. Whereas with Rx, if you cancel something, your exception will not get delivered. With coroutines, your exception will get delivered unless you have specifically made this coroutine cooperative. So you're specifically checking if the coroutine is alive or not, and then if it's dead, throw a cancellation exception instead of the real, real uh, result. So this is also a bit different from how Rx worked. Another important and uh, weird thing is that async will schedule a result regardless of when you try to stop it. So if you try to stop it while it's still working, yeah, the stop will arrive and you will cancel it, but it will, actually, it will actually not cancel. It will just deliver the result anyway. So it's kind of weird behavior. Um, and I, I published this on GitHub. If, if you're interested to play around with, the, with these or with any other use case you can think of, um, I'll, sh I'll, I'll show you the link. So it's, uh, it's a lot of surprises for 
it's it's not just me it's a couple of people that I work with and we are all like why is this happening how is this working so we we dug up a bit and then um, we figured out that there are these specific use cases for example with async with context that that are uh, particularly interesting um, a few more things worth mentioning is that coroutine scope now it didn't, it didn't used to have this but now it has this is active flag which will go to your current context get to the job check if it's active or not so from within any type of coroutine or a suspending function you are able to check if it's active or not there the, the, so the kotlin developers they're trying to tell you please be cooperative so please invest time into making your async code or, or your slow code, network code, please invest time into making it cooperative. Check if it's active or not. Throw a cancellation exception if it's dead instead of returning a result, instead of returning and uh, throwing a, a real exception like network not reachable or something. So they're trying to tell you be more cooperative. Um, one more important thing to mention, um, I, I've seen this in many places so actually suspend modifier doesn't mean that you're creating a new scope it doesn't mean that you're creating a new context it just means that your code inside of this function might be slow that's it that's what it means um, also as I mentioned check before throwing and in comparison to Rx you are aware of being in a coroutine because you are in a suspending function or in a suspend lambda and your coroutine code, the whole of it, can be aware that you're doing something within a coroutine. Whereas with Rx, you say, uh, I don't know, single from callable, and inside of callable, you have no idea whether you're running in Rx or you're running in some other thread mechanism, whatever it is, you don't know. With coroutines, now using this flag, you can check, you can for sure know if it's alive or not, and then of course, with the suspend keyboard, uh, keyword, you're fully aware that you're running in a suspending function. And um, one more interesting thing uh, before we go to the last, uh, last point is the coroutine scope. So the coroutine scope is something like um, zip of singles, let's say, uh, from the Rx world. So it basically allows you to decompose work so you would run some work here, and then you would run some work here, and then some work here. But the coroutine scope will wait until all of your work is done. So whenever you use another suspending function or you launch another coroutine from inside, coroutine scope will wait until everything completes. So in this case, uh, this call collect other events here. It will block it might block something so you need to do get data you need to do this await you need to do this collect other events you need to get this sent value so these are all things that will be um, waited upon to be able to complete this root coroutine scope so if you have like three or four things that you need to run at the same time this is what coroutine scope is for and i will show you how it handles errors uh, but before that uh, i will just one last use case is also canceling coroutines, but canceling coroutines that are using simulated work. So canceling with delay. So how do you, so what happens actually? Um, as maybe anticipated, all of them get canceled because delay is not doing any actual work. So delay is just sitting there. If you cancel it, it can immediately get out of the event loop. It can immediately stop waiting because it's waiting it's not doing anything and again run blocking whether you're using delay or you're using a while loop or your network call doesn't matter run blocking always crashes doesn't go to the exception handler it has no awareness of the coroutine scope of the coroutine context nothing run blocking always crashes your app it's like a runtime exception um, Coroutine scope is similar in a way to run blocking because run blocking also waits for all children to complete. Same as coroutine scope, but in this case, since we use delay, uh, there, are no, there are no children that are working, they're just waiting. So delay is just waiting, and then coroutine scope can cancel as well. Um, one more interesting 
thing about this use case that I showed you before with coroutine scope. So let's say this repository call fails. Uh, what happens, so repository get data, it can crash here, and it's used for the first time here. So if here it, it, it crashes here, this data will never be available, so the whole con coroutine scope, the whole thing gets canceled. It's, it throws an error, it, it gets canceled, goes to the default exception handler. But this send running event or collect other events, both of these can also cancel or throw. In this case, the final line display with the sent value will not get executed. So you're expecting a value here at sent, you're expecting a value here at await. So the coroutines compiler is smart enough and it will figure out that if this top part crashes, it will not execute this part. If your second part crashes, your third part will not get executed. But only if you have sent value and you have data value without any exceptions, only in this case it will execute the display. So that's the, that's the thing about hierarchy. So you don't have to think about it, you just write your code, it looks like synchronous code, but it's actually way more complex than this. Um, the, the debugger also works, before someone asks, debugger also works in all of these cases and works perfectly. I haven't found any issues in the ca last couple of months, not counting Studio 3.5, but with coroutines, I haven't found any real issues. Like, debugger works. Um, and finally, some key takeaways from ReactiveX. Um, we have a single stream, you have one reaction for error, one reaction for uh, success. Cancellation does not deliver errors because you don't have to think about being cooperative. You don't have to think about, oh, should I throw a cancellation exception or not. Uh, completable from this world is kind of similar to launch. Single is kind of similar to async. Single on a scheduler is kind of similar to with context. And zip of singles, as I mentioned, is kind of similar to coroutine scope. Um, and one more important thing to note is that you can combine both of these, so you can convert from Rx to coroutines, and from coroutines to Rx, it's a bit more difficult, but you can. Um, and most importantly, probably, retrofit is cooperative. So every call to retrofit is fully cooperative. So they will check if it's canceled, they will check before DNS, they will check before parsing, they will check before requesting a response, they will check before, like, every step of the way they check. So it's fully cooperative and it's safe to use. Um, and about coroutines, just one thing, test, test, and check assumptions. Like, don't assume that because in some tutorial or in the uh, Try Kotlin website, it works with the delay function, it might not work in your use case. Your use case might be completely different, and just test. Yeah, that's the main point, probably. Yeah, um, that would be it. So, thanks for listening. If there are any questions, 